characters in the Old Testament, and we are connecting their stories to the great story, the redemption story of Jesus. And so um, we've looked at various different characters. We're still in Genesis. Um, we're going to do this for a couple more weeks, and then we're going to take a break for Advent and um, look at um, Advent for about four weeks, and then do a Christmas service, and then the beginning of the new year, we'll begin again in um, continuing this series. And so this morning, we're looking at a man by the name of Isaac. And as I prepared for Isaac, I realized that there's a little bit of content on Isaac, but the story that I'm going to be looking at really has a lot to do more with his father, Abraham. Um, and so we're going to continue Abraham for a little while. And so Genesis 22 is our text. I want to read from verses 1 through verses 18. And so this is a test that God gives Abraham. And it says, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took his two young men with him and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, of Ab third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, I and the boy will go over there and worship and come back again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. And so they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, and he said, Here I am, son. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place which God had told them, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order, and he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the, thicker by, in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven, and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the heavens of the earth and as the sand that is on the seashore, and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham lived at Beersheba. Lord Jesus, as we dive into this word, would you speak to us? Would you change us for your glory? In Jesus' name. Sometimes obedience is easy. Sometimes. Take the example um, to give thanks in all circumstances. When my life and the circumstances of my life are going well, or the way that I think they should be going, that command to give thanks in all circumstances is incredibly easy because everything is good, because it's easy to obey. It costs me nothing. But what about those times in our lives, what about those circumstances in our life when obedience isn't so easy, when obedience is actually costly? How do we obey when obedience costs us. And let me give you a very practical illustration. A young woman, a follower of Jesus, is working at a restaurant at a, as a waitress. Because of her commitment to Jesus, she does her best work in everything that she does. And 
Everyone loves her for her hard work. Her bosses appreciate her. Up until now, everything has been going good because she works hard. But recently, her boss came to her and said, all the other servers are complaining because you're reporting the full amount of your tips to the IRS. And because of that, we're all concerned because your figure keeps coming up much higher than the rest of ours. And the IRS is going to get suspicious and catch on to the fact that the rest of us are not reporting everything that we earn. I want you to quit reporting the full amount of your earnings. See, now this woman is faced with a test. On the one hand, she wants her coworkers to like her. She doesn't want to lose her job. This is her livelihood. This is what she is good at. This is how she provides for herself and her family. But on the other hand, she doesn't want to disobey her Lord. How does she obey when obedience is costly? This for her has now become a test. Does it cost her something, regardless of what decisions she makes? See, now, you might hear that illustration and you might say, that doesn't sound like a test to me. I know exactly what I do. It's quite simple. I'd be more than happy to leave this job and do something else, or I'd be more than happy to keep doing it and let the chips fall as they may. Maybe it's easy for you because you might not hold dear to financial security like this woman does. Or maybe you don't hold dear to, the, to other people's approval of you, whether they approve you or not. So for obedience, for you in this circumstance, might not be that costly. But where is the place in your life where obedience is costly? What are those things that you hold on to so dearly that maybe you find yourselves, find these things competing in your life for even first place in your life. Maybe it has to do with confessing a wrong. Maybe you actually wrong somebody, and obedience means that you actually go and confess to them what you have done wrong, and you ask forgiveness. See, most of us might have done something wrong, but maybe we might acknowledge the wrong. Maybe we might say, hey, we screwed up, but we never, com and we might commit that we will never do it again ourselves, but we never go and apologize and take it any further than that. In that case, obedience isn't necessarily costly at all, but that isn't really obedience, is it? Maybe it's a topic of giving. For all of us, obedience to give is easy when we're giving off the top of what we have. But what about when obedience means that you really have to dig deep? Maybe you're called to give in such a way that it even puts your own financial security in question. And at that point, do we find that there is a commitment in our life that is com competing with our obedience to Jesus? That our desire to be secure is taking first place over our desire to obey? Maybe it's the command to love your enemies. That's costly. What does it cost to love people like ISIS who are happily killing Christians all over the world and just beheading them left and right? Or on a more personal level, what does it cost to love someone who is maliciously intended to hurt you? What does it look like to love these people, to obey the command of Jesus to love your enemies? Or maybe he's put a specific command in your life to maybe stay in a tough marriage to fight for your marriage, or maybe to stay in a tough job when your bosses or your peers don't recognize all the hard work that you do, maybe to let go of something in your life that you cling on to so dearly. All of us have places in our life where obedience in G to Jesus is going to cost us something deeply. All of us in our life, at one point, or another will come to a place of testing where we will have to decide what is most important to us. Is it obedience to Jesus or is it something else? How do we obey when it's costly? Abraham gives us a model in our passage. Genesis 22 verse 1 tells us that Abraham in this story is being tested by God. 
the test of Abraham's commitment comes down to whether or not the most important person in his life is God himself or is it his son Isaac. See, what we find is when faced with the test, Abraham determines as much as he loves his son, as much as that is the most important person to him on this planet, he is willing to let go of that child in order to take hold of his God, and Abraham is commended for it, and the promises of God are more fully confirmed to him. Where are you this morning? Where are you personally wrestling with the cost of obedience to Jesus? Maybe you're in a true test like Abraham was. You're at a crossroads in your life of deciding, is Jesus going to be first in my life, or is it going to be something else or someone else? Or maybe you're not at that kind of intense situation, but it's just simple obedience. Will I obey what Jesus says? It is simply following his commands that you are wrestling with. Or maybe you're not wrestling at all, and you should be. Where are you right now? I want you to take a moment and think about that thing or that situation or that person that God is bringing to your mind right now. And I want you to hear the instructions that are in this passage that this passage gives us of how to obey when obedience is hard. And we're going to answer three questions this morning that we find from this text. Number one, how do we obey when we know what to do? How do we obey when we know what to do? Number two, how do we obey when we know what to do, but we don't know how to do it? And number three, how do we obey when we just don't want to do it? See, that last one is the real kicker for most of us. We know what Jesus tells us to do. We just don't want to do it. So let's begin with the first question. How do we obey when we know what to do? See, there are many situations in our walk with Jesus where we actually don't know what Jesus is telling us to do. The scripture doesn't necessarily speak to us on specific topics of, am I supposed to marry this person or that person? Or am I supposed to take this job or that job? Or am I supposed to live in this place or that place? The scripture doesn't necessarily give you instructions on specific answers to those questions. But this situation that Abraham is facing is not like that. The situation that you're facing maybe isn't like that either. It's very clear what God is calling you to do. For Abraham, God says flat out in verse, 20, verse 2, he says, Take your son, your son Isaac, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will tell you. That's the command. It is very clear. <coughs> now, there's some strange and there's some serious theological and moral difficulties that need to be contended in this passage that we'll deal with in a second. But before we get there, notice what Abraham does. God gives him a command, go to this land, take your son Isaac, and offer him as a burnt offering. Notice what Abraham does. He obeys quickly. He obeys quickly. When you know what you're supposed to do, the answer to the question, what are you supposed to do? You obey quickly. Verse 3 says, Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. Abraham rose quickly. This is not an insignificant detail that Moses records for us that he writes, Moses, Abraham rose early. He knew that what God had asked him to do, and he immediately set into motion his act of obedience to God's command. He didn't wait. See, this is what the heart of obedience really is. It's to do it quickly. Thomas Akempis was a follower of Jesus who lived in the 14th century, and he wrote a book called The Imitation of Christ. He is quoted to have said that instant obedience is the only kind of obedience there is. Delayed obedience is actually disobedience. I don't know about you, but if you're a parent, this is what you try to impress on your children, isn't it? When we say, come here, it means come here now. It doesn't mean come here five minutes later. It doesn't mean come here whenever you're done, whatever you're doing. It means when we say, come here, it means come here right now. Unless we say, come here in five minutes or come here whenever you're finished doing whatever you're doing. We want our kids to learn that it is good and safe for them to respond 
to us immediately when we ask them to do something. So it's important that we press upon our kids that obedience means doing what we ask without arguing, without complaining, without delaying. Abraham provides us a model for that. Well, we need to show our kids what this looks like so that they can also respond to God like Abraham did, without arguing, without complaining, without questioning, without delaying. But there's another practical reason of why when we know what to do, we should do it immediately. Here's why. Obedience doesn't come easy with time. When we know what to do, especially when it's going to be costly, the decision doesn't get easier with time. What happens is when we tend to delay the process, oftentimes we end up not doing it at all. Listen, every one of us comes out of the womb with a PhD in rationalization and self-justification. Given enough time, we can all argue our way or talk ourselves out of something or into something. We can do it. All of us can do it. When we know what to do, we ought to do it quickly. On a practical level, how many times has the Holy Spirit impressed on you to do something? Maybe it's to give, or maybe it's to call someone and check on how they're doing, or maybe it's to invite someone for lunch after church, or maybe it's to take someone out for dinner. And you know the Holy Spirit is impressing on you because those thoughts just come out of nowhere, and that's there, but you delay it and delay it. And what happens over time? You completely forget about it. You don't do it. Delayed obedience is disobedience. See, when obedience is costly, it doesn't help for us to dwell upon the cost of that thing for some period of time. Instead, like Abraham, we should do it and do it immediately. So right where you are this morning, right in the place where you're sitting, I want you to think about that situation or that person or um, that thing that God is impressing on your mind. And I want you to resolve in your heart right now that as soon as you are able, early in the morning, first thing, as soon as you walk out of this place, you are going to obey God and do what he has asked you to do. You're going to do it. See, this is what it means to call Jesus your Lord. What it means to say that Jesus is your Lord means that he asks you to do something, you do it. You're obedient to it. You don't question it. You don't wrestle with it. You don't rationalize it. When he tells you to do it, you obey. You know, Jesus himself tells us that he has little patience with people that call him Lord, Lord, and then doesn't do what he tells them to do. He says, to those people who call him Lord, Lord, and then doesn't do his commands and his rules, he actually tells them, depart from me, because I never knew you. When you know what you're supposed to do, Scripture teaches us you do it, and you do it immediately. Second question. How do we obey when we know what to do, but we don't know how to actually do it? What provision is there for us when we don't know how to obey or do the thing that God has called us to do? This is not an unusual circumstance. The short answer is that when you don't know what God has called you, when you don't know how to do what God has called you to do in those situations, you need to trust God fully. You need to trust him fully. I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you to actually answer it. Maybe raise your hand. How many of you have ever heard a testimony, or maybe it might be your own testimony, that goes something like this, that you said, man, we felt God impressing on us to do this thing, or get engaged in this ministry, or go on this mission trip, or take this act of faith, and looking at our own resources, we didn't have the resources to do that. But we felt so strongly that we were supposed to do it that we went ahead and did it. And to our amazement, God provided exactly what we needed when we needed it. If you ever heard that testimony, can you raise your hand? If that's your life, can you raise your hand? Look around the room. Look at how many hands are raised. You know what this means? It's not unusual for God to do this. When God asks you to do something, 
and he's, you don't have the resources to do it, but he is impressing on your heart to do it, if he's asking you to do it, you can trust that he will provide for you. How many of those guys that just a couple weeks ago shared of their mission trip experiences, they wrestled with, God, will I be able to provide the finances for this? And lo, to their own amazement, people began to give toward them. How many times in your own life God impressed on you to do something and you did it, and to your amazement, God took care of whatever thing you were worried about. He is absolutely faithful. If he is impressing on your heart to do something and you don't have the resources or don't know how to do it, trust him that he will provide for you. If you find yourself in a position where God is calling you to do something that you don't know how you will do what you're supposed to do, let me encourage you. You're in the majority. You're not in the minority there because that's how God leads us. This is the normal Christian life. You see, when God calls us and asks us to do something and we don't know how we will do it, this is an opportunity not for this is not an opportunity for us to disobey. This is not an opportunity for us to say, God, I don't have the resources. I'm not going to do it. This is an opportunity for us to trust God. This is an opportunity for us to say, God, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I don't know when this is going to happen, but you are impressing this on my heart, and I am going to trust if you are the one telling me to do this, you're going to take care of me. You're going to provide for me. You will meet whatever need there is in this circumstance. This is an opportunity for us to see the provision of God working. Imagine the difficulty that Abraham has put in here. Compare your situation to his. This is not an unusual command that God has given Abraham. In verse 2, God says to Abraham, Take your son that you love and turn him into a burnt offering. You might let that word slip by you, that word burnt offering. But I assure you, when Abraham heard of those words, it didn't slip by him. He heard exactly what God told him to do. See, we don't have a visual image of what a burnt offering looks like. But Leviticus 1 tells us what happens in a burnt offering. Here's what happens. In a burnt offering, the worshiper brings an animal, or usually a lamb or a bull, to the place of sacrifice. And the worshiper is supposed to lay his head on the head, lay his hand on the head of the sacrifice, signifying that this animal has become his substitute. I am bringing this animal as my substitute. The laying on of hands signifies the transference of guilt, that this animal is going to die for my sins. And then the worshiper is supposed to take this animal and slay it in a way that most of us would not even consider humane. And then after that, he is to take the blood and sprinkle it all around, indicating that the wages of sin has been fully play, paid. Blood has been shed. And then he's supposed to take the carcass of that animal and cut it into pieces and arrange it in a specific way upon the altar. And then he is supposed to burn the whole thing out completely, making atonement for God, to God. This is what a burnt offering is. It's hard imagining even doing that to an animal. Abraham has been asked to do that to his son. See, while this is an unusual command for Abraham, I don't think it's an uncon unconceivable command for him. In Exodus 22, the scriptures makes it plain clear, plainly clear that the firstborn always belongs to God, whether it's an animal or a man. The firstborn was always God. In the case of an animal, the firstborn animal should be sacrificed to God. In the case of a man, God provides a ransom. When the firstborn is born, an animal dies in the place of that man. But regardless of the fact that God has given a ransom, doesn't neglect the fact that God demands that the firstborn belongs to him. See, in Abraham's mind, he was figuring that God had always provided a substitute. This time, God was actually calling him to give up his own son himself. And notice God doesn't say to Abraham, I want you to go into Isaac's tent and I want you to murder him. He doesn't say that at all. He says, I want you to bring him up as a burnt offering. I want you to bring me what you owe. Unusual, yes. Unconceivable, I don't think so. Difficult, incredibly so. This is his son. It's his only son. 
We know that he had Ishmael, but in the previous chapter in Genesis 21, God commands Abraham to send Ishmael and Hagar off, and now Isaac is left. Isaac is his only son. This is the hope for Abraham and his family on carrying on the legacy of his family. And in case you think that Abraham is some kind of religious fanatic that does this stuff just out of the whim, verse 2 says, God specifically says, Abraham, bring your son, your only son whom you love. Abraham loved this kid. He loved him. God knew that. God knew how much Abraham loved Isaac. And God could have said, take Isaac. Abraham knows who Isaac is. God goes further and says, God, take Isaac, the son whom you love. See, God knew the cost of what he was asking Abraham to do. And Abraham knows the cost. Not only is the hope of his family found in Isaac, but the promise of salvation is found through the descendants of Isaac. It is through Isaac that all the promises of God were supposed to be fulfilled. We know that Abraham was given a promise by God, and this action seems contrary to everything that God had promised. Yet neither the unusualness of this command or the difficulty of the command prevented Abraham from obeying immediately when God told him to go take his son. Abraham was actually trusting that God would provide, that somehow that though he couldn't see it, though he didn't know how all of this would go down, he trusted that God would provide for him. I want you to draw your attention to verse 8 and verse 14. In verse 8, Abraham says, God will provide a lamb for himself for a burnt offering, my son. And so the two of them went together. In verse 14, Abraham calls the name of that place, the Lord will provide. Some of you in your Bibles, there's a footnote there of what the Hebrew is actually saying. The Hebrew translation actually says God will see. He will see. Like with his eyes, he will see. It's translated he will provide because that's the intention of the word. But all week I've been thinking about what this word means. The connection between God seeing and God providing. What is this connection that Abraham could see that could cause him to say this about God? Here's what I think it is. Our God is our God not that not only sees us, but when he sees us, he provides for us. When God sees that there is a need, it is as good as saying that when he sees it, he will provide. His seeing and need and his provision for that need are so closely connected that we can exchange the one for the other. For God to see is for God to provide. Think about Genesis 3. Go back all the way to the story of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve sin. They're now naked, standing, hiding from God, and God sees them in their nakedness. What does God do? He provides clothing for them. God sees their needs and provides. Abraham had such a rock-solid trust in his God as provider that he knew that God would see the need, and as surely as he saw it, he would provide for him. See, Abraham was thinking that God would raise Isaac from the dead. He fully expected in his mind to kill Isaac on the altar. He didn't go there thinking that he wasn't going to sacrifice Isaac. We read in verse 5, Abraham said to the young men, he said, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go there and worship and then come back to you. It's not as clear in the English, but in the Hebrew it's very clear. It says, we will go over there, we will worship, and we will come back. Abraham trusted that these in between these two events of going there and worship and coming back, in between those two events, he would actually have to kill his son. Hebrews 11 gives us an insight into what Abraham was thinking. In verse 17 through 19, he said, he considered that God was able to raise him from the dead. That's what Abraham believed. Abraham trusts that God would see the need, and even if it means raising his son from the dead, that wasn't too much for God, that God could do that. Can you imagine what kind of radical life you would live if you truly, truly believed that every time you had a need, he would see it and he would provide for it. That every time he impressed on you to do something that was going to stretch you, 
that you could obey, trusting that if he's called you to do it, he would take care of you. He would provide for you. Listen, this is not a prosperity teaching of you give and then God will bless you back. That's not what we're saying here. We're not saying just try to give and so try to manipulate and try to get something back. We're saying when you are obedient to God and God impresses something on your heart, you can trust him. But if he is the one impressing that on you, he'll take care of you. You know, this is what the Christian life is supposed to look like. This is supposed to be our everyday life. Scripture says it as followers of Jesus, we trust and we obey. There's a passage of Scripture that says we walk by, what is it? We walk by faith. It doesn't say we walk by sight, does it? It doesn't say we see the provision and then we move forward. It doesn't say that. It says when God impresses us on something, we walk by faith, fully trusting that this God we serve sees us and is able to provide for us. How do we obey when we know what to do? How do we obey when we know what to do but we don't know how to do it? But how do we obey when we just don't want to obey? How do we obey when we just don't want to? God, I know what you say, but I just don't want to do it. I was actually talking to someone just a few weeks ago on the phone that was referred to me for counseling, and he's not in this room, and it's not one of you guys, but um, Christian guy, loves Jesus, but he's dating a girl from a different back, faith background, and he decided that he and his girlfriend were going to move in together, and they were going to live as husband and wife and everything that entails. And when he told me this, I asked him the question, said, do you really think because the Bible is clear on sex outside of marriage and that it is wrong and there is no question about it. I asked him, do you really feel that what you're doing here is in obedience to Jesus? Do you feel that what you are doing is what Jesus is asking you to do? And he said, no. I know that this is not what I'm supposed to do, but I don't know just what I'm supposed to do, so I'm praying about it. I'm like, okay. I don't know exactly what you're praying about there, but um, it's pretty simple. You know that you walked away from God in disobedience. Scripture says that when you disobey, there is grace for us that we turn back and we repent and we come back and we do the right thing, that there is no condemnation for us. We come right back to him. He forgives us and sets us back on the right path. And he replied, I don't know. I know what I'm supposed to do. I just don't know. I just don't want to do it. I don't want to give up this thing that me and my girlfriend have. And not to mention the fact that if I do give this up, I don't know how we will financially be able to make it. I'm also afraid that she might not want to be with me if I tell her that I don't want to live with her anymore. See, obedience for him at this point has become something incredibly costly. See, when we step back, we can see that he's put his relationship with this woman in the place of God. He put that over obedience to Jesus. See, that might not be your situation. That might seem like an easy test for you. You might think, I know what to do. I will do it. But I know what it feels like when God tells me to do something in my life and in my heart, I just don't want to do it. I don't want to obey. You know, for me, it's being totally honest. It's forgiving people who have wronged me in the past. I would like to, I would rather hold on to that instead of letting it go and moving forward. And I hold on to it, hang on to it, and that's become more important to me than obeying the command of Jesus to forgive. Or maybe it's confronting someone in your life about a sin in their life. But for you, that relationship and that friendship is more valuable to you and obedience to Jesus and making sure your friend is pursuing Jesus with their life. Or when God asks you to change, and you know what change entails, but it's more important for you to hang on to this way of living or this particular thing than it is for you to obey Jesus. What do we do 
in circumstances when we just don't want to do what Jesus is asking us to do. Because we've all been there. We have. So that this guy that I talked about to myself and to you, what do we do when we don't want to do what Jesus tells us? Here's what I tell you to do. I would say consider him. Consider him. And I would say consider him frequently. First of all, consider him who is the true and better father. See, Abraham and every earthly father that's ever lived, even at their very best, is only a dim shadow of our heavenly father. Even the very best fathers ask their children to do things that are not in the best interest of their child. Maybe we ask them to do things because we're being selfish, or maybe we're just ignorant and we don't know better that this is the best that we can do as earthly fathers. See, I think sometimes we struggle to obey the commands of our heavenly father because we think that he's just like our earthly father, that he's somehow doing the best that he can, but he just doesn't really know my situation or my circumstances and what I'm facing here, that I have a much better angle than God does, and so I better just do what I think is best and just ignore what God is telling me. But you know, God, our Heavenly Father, our Heavenly God is not like that. Some of you have a more negative perception of this God. You're actually thinking that he's not a good guy trying to do his best, but that he actually has an aggressive stance towards you, that he's this power-hungry guy that randomly calls you out to do things just to show you that he's the boss and that you aren't going to put up with him anymore. Can I tell you that our Heavenly Father is not like that either? He may seem like that in this passage when we read about Isaac. You may think that God is that way in this passage, but you know what? When God asks us to do something, it's not primarily for his sake. It's for our sake. It's for us. See, Isaac, for Abraham, has now become in a place of competition in Abraham's life. Abraham needed to do this thing not for... God's sake, but for Abraham's sake. See, it's not healthy for Abraham to have Isaac in the place of God. It's not healthy for Isaac to be put in a place where he shouldn't be. And when God asked this individual that I mentioned earlier to repent and do the right thing and not live with this woman like their husband and wife before they're married, that's not for God's sake. That's for his sake. That's for the girl's sake. They're the ones that will suffer if they continue to reject the good father's command. It is not safe for us to disobey the father's command because the commands that he actually gives us are for our good because he knows what's good for us. So consider him. Consider him when you don't want to do what he's asked you to do. Consider the father whose commands are always for your good. Secondly, Consider the true and better sacrifice. Consider the true and better sacrifice that this father made. Abraham was called to go to the land of Moriah in verse 2. The land of Moriah is actually hills that surrounded the city of Jerusalem. On this very hill where Abraham was supposed to sacrifice Isaac, God would provide a substitute, an animal that would die in Isaac's place so that Isaac wouldn't have to die. In 2 Chronicles 3.1, the scripture tells us that King Solomon built a temple on this very same mountain that Isaac was supposed to be sacrificed. And the purpose of this, did I say mountain? I, I, Abraham, Solomon was supposed to build a temple on this very same mountain. And the purpose of this temple was so that the people of God could come and meet a holy God. But in order for them to have reconciliation between them and God, a sacrifice needed to be made. Blood had to be shed. And for year after year after year, the people of God were learning that without the shedding of blood, there would be no forgiveness of sins. You know, it's on one of those same hills outside of Jerusalem that another son walked up those hills carrying the wood of his own sacrifice on his back. But for this son... When he reached the top, there was no substitute for him. There was no animal waiting there for him. This son, 
He was the substitute. He was the one that all the animal sacrifices in the Old Testament was pointing to. He was the one whom, when the father reached back his hand to dis- kill his son, that there was no one there to stop him to when the father brought down the crushing blow of his wrath. The father sacrificed his son for you and for me. What does that sacrifice mean exactly? To sacrifice is to give up something valuable for something even more valuable. Give up something important for something more important. The scripture says that when the father sacrificed his son, he did it for you and he did it for me. What does that say about you? It says that you are so valuable. It says that you are so precious. It says that he loves you so much that he would sacrifice his son for you. And not only this, but the son, the son gives up his own life. He sacrifices that which is dear to him. And I ask, do you want to ignore the commands of the one who was demonstrated so plainly, demonstrated so clearly his love for you? Do you know what God says to Abraham when Abraham was about to strike Isaac? Listen to what he says in verse 7 of Genesis 22. He says, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For I now I know that you fear God. The Hebrew concept for that word fear is much bigger than our English word can ever communicate. It suggests a heartfelt devotion, honor. The best word that we can come up with is the word love. Now I know that you love me, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Don't you see? On this side of Calvary, for those of us who have experienced the grace of God, we can look at Calvary and we could say, God, now I know you love us. Now I know you love us. Now I know that we are precious to you. Now I know that I can trust you. Why? Because you did not withhold your son. You did not withhold your only son for us. Don't you see? When you are struggling to obey, when you don't want to obey, consider the better sacrifice that was made for you. Finally, consider him who is the true and better son. Consider the true and better Isaac. Isaac, he walked willingly for the sacrifice. Now he walked willingly because he had no idea what was about to happen. He says, I see the fire, I see the knife, but where's the lamb? It seems to me that when Isaac did find out that he was going to be the sacrifice, that Abraham actually had to bind him to the altar. And I can't blame Isaac for that. But you know, when Jesus was walking up that hill, carrying the wood on his back, he knew exactly what it was going to cost him. And even though nails pinned him up to the cross, there was no reason in hell that he would ever leave that cross until he fully paid the price of your salvation. Never would he stop. No matter how deep the temptation, no matter how much they mocked him, he refused to come down until the debt was paid. Isaac was figuratively raised back from the dead Jesus spent three days dead for our salvation, but he is now raised back to life, and now he lives and he reigns forever. Can you imagine how much this God is for you, how much he cares for you? Can you imagine how much for your good he loves you? And why can't you obey him? Would we want to ignore the commands of one like this? See, if we truly consider what he paid, what he did, 
I wouldn't think so. I want you to consider one more thing in this passage and I'll close. Abraham wasn't a young man when he was making the sacrifice. He was well past 100 years old. Some of you think, a couple of things, some of you think that the temptations that you face now, the testing that you face now will go away as you get older. No. Some of you, on the flip side, think that because you're older, that God isn't going to stretch you. And I suggest to you that just because you are older, the call to radical faith and obedience to Jesus will never be done. Listen to God's call for your life. Listen to those places in your life where he is calling you to obey. I don't know about you, when I hear the needs of the world and even the needs of our own community and how overwhelming that can be, I can't help but think that maybe that God has helped and prepared and resourced some of you to make a radical lifestyle change, to make a radical commitment, to make a radical mission because your heart is so captivated with love for Jesus and what he has done for you. When your hearts are touched by his love, no longer do we find ourselves saying, oh God, I can't live without this. I can't live without him or I can't live without her. I can't do what you're asking me to do. But instead, when our hearts are moved by the love of Jesus, we can say, oh Father, I thought I could never do this. I thought I would never be able to live without this. I thought I would never be able to live without that. But God, I see that you love me. I see that you are calling me. I see that your eyes are on me. I offer up all that I have. My life is yours. Take and do with me as you please. Even if you call me to die, I trust you. Because you are a good, good God. Obedience is not always easy. It's hard. But when you know what to do, do it quickly. When you don't know how to do it, trust God to provide for you. And when you don't want to do it, consider him who is the true and better sacrifice, the true and better son, and the true and better Father. Consider him who loves you with an everlasting love and surrender yourself to that love in joyful obedience to him. This morning, we come to the table. There is nothing that communicates to us better how much he loves us than what this table symbolizes. The little wafer symbolizes the body of Jesus that was broken for your sins and my sins. The, blood, the juice symbolizes the blood that was spilt for all that we have done. This table communicates to us that we have a true and better father who is willing to let his own son die for you communicates to us we have a true and better son who willingly went up to the hill and died for your sins and my sins communicates to us we have a true and better sacrifice that when he shed his blood it is finished there's nothing else we need to do he has taken all of it on himself we are forgiven we're accepted we're loved This morning, some of us need to be reminded that obedience to Jesus might be costly, but it's worth it. I'm going to invite you to examine your hearts, your attitudes, your affections, your desires. I'm going to invite you to just spend some time with Jesus. You know exactly the person or the thing or the situation that God is dealing with you this morning. And you've got a choice to make. Will you obey? Will Jesus be first in your life? Will Jesus be everything to you? Or 
Or is he going to say that this person or situation or thing is going to compete with Jesus? As you wrestle with God, I'm going to invite you to spend some time with him. And whenever you're ready, you're welcome to come and grab the elements. Over the last several weeks, we have had people in the front in the beginning of worship inviting available that if you wanted someone to pray with you, that they would pray with you. This morning, we're going to do it during communion. This gives us a little bit more time. There's going to be someone on the left and someone on the right. If you just want someone to pray with you and encourage you and just speak God's words into your life, when you're grabbing the elements, stop with them. Just have them pray over you, and then you may be seated. So I'm going to invite the guys who are going to be praying up forward, and then the rest of you guys, whenever you're ready, you're welcome to come. Grab the elements, and then whenever you're done, go back to your seats and we'll partake of this meal.